The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 136 of the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. And this is an extra special episode as we are interviewing a dynamic duo of thriller authors in C.M. Adler and A.K. Alexander. Together, they are the co-authors behind the new book, Deadly Affairs, which is available today, September 1st. So make sure you follow the links in the show notes to get that book. It is incredible, and you're going to hear a great sample chapter from us today. But during the interview, we are discussing subjects such as what creates a killer, uh, the difficulty behind juggling alternate author identities, uh, censorship amongst YA, how they got started in writing together, and how this friendship has suddenly blossomed into something that's really remarkable. uh, Because you can tell they really, really get along well, and it's it's a beautiful thing to see. Uh, but also, one of the really interesting things I found, too, is us talking about the research and background information that authors do, which often the readers don't get to see, but it informs the author so that uh, so that the readers can see and feel information about a character, but they don't always see it. But <laughs> it's going to make more sense when you listen to the interview, but uh, just trust me, you're going to love this whole thing. It's really, really great. On a side note and a little bit of an inside joke, I do want to wish a belated birthday to Michelle's son, and I, I truly hope that Christine's daughter, Dylan, is having a good rest of her school year. Hey, Dylan, don't forget your iPad, okay? It's very important, so. <laughs> anyway, you all have no idea what I'm talking about, but that's okay, because it's a, it's a fun thing between the ladies and I. And uh, we had a really good time talking, and uh, this was uh, that was just some fun stuff behind the scenes. What you all don't hear is that this was actually the result of two separate interviews that we did, and then I had to splice them together, which, you know, wasn't as difficult as I thought it was going to be. So hopefully everything sounds good. I, I believe you're going to enjoy this interview as much as I did uh, doing it, and of course editing it back together. It was just a lot of fun. All of this and more is coming up in just a couple of minutes, but first, I want to thank our sponsors, starting with you, Store All, the number one self-storage facility in the Warrensburg area. They have two locations, both of them fully fenced, gated with your own private gate code, and with more than 60 cameras recording 24 hours a day. They have non-climate control and climate control, and that climate control means air-conditioned, heated, and dehumidification, so it's the real thing. This is not something that's just closed off with, you know, maybe there's an air conditioner or a space heater. No, no, no. This is the real deal. So they also run both facilities off of solar power, so they are clean and green locations. Hey, check them out online at ustoral.net. That is spelled the letter U-S-T-O-R-A-L-L dot net. I also want to thank my favorite writing software, Scrivener. I use it every day, and my numbers in the past month have jumped back up. Um, I think in the last episode, I mentioned that July was my second best month of the year, and I haven't finished my numbers yet for this month. I didn't write down the last couple of days, but I need to. I, I have them. I have them in the computer, but um, yeah. So I'm gonna. I'll get those together. Maybe I can tell you next week about that. But anyway, but all of my writing I do on Scrivener, and it's. I just love it. I love it so much, and everywhere I go, I just love that I can pull it up on my phone or on my iPad. It's on my desktop. I have it on my laptop. Anywhere I go, I've got Scrivener right there waiting with whatever story I'm working on. Doesn't matter. It knows where I left off, and it has it all right there together for me. Hey, check out this commercial with more information about Scrivener, and pay special attention to the coupon code so you can save 20% on the regular desktop version. Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scrivener. 
Now I know you've heard about Scrivener because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scrivener's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, project goals, and let's not forget that amazing corkboard, you can see why I use Scrivener every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scrivener Writing Software, built by writers for writers. All right. I also want to thank our podcast network friends, starting with Pop Goes the Culture Network. Uh, We've been with them for well over a year now and having a blast with them with shows like Fanatics and the Fan, The Amazing Nerd Show, The Way Awesome Show, and a few more that they've added recently. I need to update my notes (laughs) so I can give you the proper information. But click that link in the show notes and you'll find out more of what they have to offer. And uh, oh, and their flagship show, Pop Goes a Culture Podcast, is coming back this week. They go live Thursday nights, so make sure uh, whenever you click that link, find out where you can tune in live and uh, interact with the with the gang as they record the episode. And my other podcast network, Project Entertainment Network, with 35 different shows from writing to baseball to horror to monsters to, oh gosh, anything, almost anything. It's available right there within the Project Entertainment Network. Hey, check out this ad for one of those amazing shows. Hi, I'm John Baldisberger, host of Madness Heart Radio. Join me each week as I discuss writing, living, life, and horror with some of the coolest people in the industry. Talk to writers, directors, actors, and really anyone at all that's involved in scaring people's pants off. Can't wait for you to join us. But until then, stay safe, but stay scared. All right. How cool is that, huh? I I tell you, you know, I know I said that uh, Project Entertainment has about 35 shows, but I'm being totally honest with you when I say I listen to about every one of them. Um, I've listened to every one of them at least once. I can say that for sure. And uh, I listen to them on a regular basis. They're great shows and a great bunch of... uh, great bunch of people over there with some amazing shows so make sure you click the link in the show notes for more about those don't forget that for our sponsors and podcast friends alike uh, they also have social media accounts where you can go and follow along for more fun things Uh, lots of fun stuff that they post regularly you can also follow us the sample chapter podcast as well on facebook and twitter and now we are on instagram it's official we have (laughs) created account finally over on Instagram. So it's just the Sample Chapter Podcast on any of those social media accounts that you can find us there. If social media is not your thing and you'd rather just reach out to me via email, you can do so at samplechapterpodcast at gmail.com. Or if you would like to send me a message, a voicemail, you can do so by calling 660-851-1146. And uh, yeah, leave me a voicemail and I look forward to sharing it on the air. So even if it's something bad, you know, I'll, I'll share it on the air. (laughs) All right. Hey, without further ado, let's get us on over to our wonderful and so fun interview with CM Adler and AK Alexander. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another exciting episode of the Sample Chapter Podcast. This week, we have a great team of co-authors who write compelling stories with just the right amount of humor to contrast the murdery bits. They are co-authors of the upcoming Deadly Affairs series. One writes as the criminal, the other writes as the detective trying to solve the crime. But which is which? We're going to find out today. Welcome to the show, C.M. Adler and A.K. Alexander. Hi, thank Good morning. You. <laughs> Good morning, indeed. Yes, it's nice and early. We're all drinking our coffee and trying to stay awake. Thus is the writer's life. Right. <laughs> so uh, I guess, first of all, how are you both doing uh, amidst the pandemic? Are you staying healthy and doing well? Yes. I Yeah. Doing, it's, it's, I'm a little stir crazy, but other than that, doing doing well. No complaints, really. Me too. I've had actually a pretty good summer. Um, I've enjoyed having a little more time at home and having things simpler. 
and I'm spending more time outside. So that's that's been a it's been a pretty good summer for me. Great. Oh man, that does sound nice. So all right, well Christine, tell me a little bit about your background and some of your some of your stories that you've previous to this. My background is primarily as um, I, I taught English and karate for several years at a boarding school. And I got into writing with more of a kind of, um, I mean, it was, it was accidentally on purpose, if that makes sense. Mm. And I did it with a short story that I submitted on an author site and ended up winning uh, $250 for the Editor's Choice Award. And I think, I think that site is gone. That was kind of before the internet was. Um, all pretty and, and made with apps. So that was called Author Stand. And I, my, my writing is primarily more of the dark fantasy horror side of things. I started out with a young adult dystopian and then quickly learned that I'm much better at writing adults and not trying to censor <laughs> the details for a younger audience. So I'm kind of in, I, I'm really at the, beginning or the in the middle of rewriting a lot of my stories and republishing them under the new name, either Christine Nielsen for the younger stuff and then the CM Adler for more of the adult genres content. Mm -hmm. So I, I ended up meeting Michelle through a mutual friend or AK um, who had worked with her before and but doesn't do, you know, the, the serial killer type stuff that she connected us with for this book uh, because of the, she said I would be perfect for writing a serial killer thriller. And it's kind of, kind of worked out that way <laughs> with the, <laughs> with the background. So I, I have a, some experience in a lot of the, I don't, what, you would say maybe tactics for these serial killers. Mm -hmm even knife throwing so that, that <laughs> it, it's a it's a really odd fit for my resume in, in a lot of ways that's got to be a, a good trusted friend who can come to you and say you would write a good serial killer <laughs> right that is someone who knows you really well i guess right, <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> yeah and i i can understand the uh the idea of I, I was the same way as far as writing for young adults because I, I learned, oh gosh, more than 20 years ago from the Institute of Children's Literature. That was my basis for learning writing. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll write young adult stories and children's stories. And I just can't. I, I can't do it. I was able to use that going forward. But, uh, and, and I'm, I'm changing some of my stories as well and bringing them forward to uh, the stories that I write today, but I just, I don't know. I just couldn't bring the story down to a, a, a very young level. Yeah. It, it's almost like when you read it, you can hear everything I'm not saying in a way. <laughs> yes. So it might as well be in the story. Yes, absolutely. Well, uh, Michelle, AK Alexander, yep. uh, give us some of your background and uh, what you like to write. Sure. Um, so I went to school to, to be, I majored in journalism at USC and I always wanted to write fiction. I mean, from the time I was a little girl, I wrote short stories and my dad's legal pads. And that was just what I wanted to do was actually be a fiction author, but you don't go to USC and tell your mom that she was like, yeah, you're not going to make any money writing creative, you know, <laughs> writing fiction. So anyway, um, I actually, my senior year of college, became pregnant with my oldest son, who is going to actually, I'm going to date myself, be 29 uh, tomorrow. And um, Alexander was born six weeks preemie. And so when I had the baby at home after I graduated, which, you know, I was going to go and I was going to be, I wanted to be a newscaster. That's what I thought I wanted to do. But I knew I always wanted to be a writer. So when, when Alex was born and he was home and I was on a lot of care of this baby, um, I decided I'm going to write a novel. And I found a course, this is before the internet, so I found a course through Writer's Digest and it was a correspondence course and I went back and forth 
with the um, with the instructor. It took me about ten months. I wrote my first book, and and I've re I've rewritten that book and revised it a couple times and, and published it. And then from that point on, so that's back in 1991. I wrote uh, about a dozen manuscripts from that time to 2004. And in 2004, I, I went from writing thrillers, which is what I'd been doing and I'd been submitting and sending stuff out. And this is at the time, obviously, where indie publishing there, you know, was looked down upon. It was called, um, what was it? Like vanity publishing or I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah self-publishing was not, was, was not looked upon the way it is now. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was struggling to get an agent and then uh, what happened was I had written kind of like a, I'd been, I'd been to the wine country and I had written a sort of uh, adult Nancy Drew out on the vineyard, right? Like a whodunit mm. and sent it into an agent and she responded with, and mind you, at this point, I had only written like two chapters because I'd gotten so many rejections over the years. Like I'm talking probably I could wallpaper a, a room with rejection letters. <laughs> and so when she wrote me back, um, she said, well, can you send me the whole manuscript? And I'm like, oh, God, um, it's <laughs> done. But you don't tell the agent who actually finally wants your stuff. Well, it's not finished. So I said, sure, I'm just making some edits. So I finished it within a month. And I uh, sent it in, and the title of that book was Murder on Court. We had a publishing deal within two weeks for three books in the series, which was a great. I, I, first of all, I didn't know it was going to be a series. I got a call from her and said, I have a publisher. Um, at, it, at the time, it was just Penguin. It's now Penguin Random House. Um, Berkeley Prime Crime wants, to, wants the book, but they want to know what the next two books in the series are about. And I'm like, okay, didn't know we were doing a series. Anyway, I did. I, I wrote up, a, I said, when do they want to know? And she said, by the end of the day, what the next two books are about. So I did brief synopsis on each one, sent them in. I wound up doing um, nine books in that series. Did I do nine? I, yeah. And then, and then we sold another series of three books for another mystery series to them. Uh, and then the way I got into indie publishing then in 2009, Really, when when we had the recession, um, I it was probably not my best idea to ask for more money on advances for the next books because they dropped my two series. But in hindsight, it wasn't a bad thing either because that was about the time that KDP was going up, and you were doing mm. you know, writers were, were there. There's, there was the availability to publish, and and the i and the idea around self publishing was really changing, right? Mm -hmm. So I just took all this backlist stuff that I had, all these thrillers. I picked the pen name, A.K. Alexander, after my kids, Anthony, Caitlin, Alexander, put them up there, which was um, Daddy's Home is actually the first book in this series from what we're going to read from today. There's four books in the series. So I put up Daddy's Home. I put up all these backlists and nothing happened for about a year. And I was writing and, you know, I would check my reports. And then I it still... I still can't explain what happened. I, it was a phenomenon. I one morning um, was checking reports and daddy's home was selling like in time. I could see it in real time, like a hundred, 200, you know, by the end of the week, there's like oh, wow. 10,000 copies sold in the UK. It went to number one in Amazon UK it back in 2000, oh, this is 2011. Then six months later, here in the United States, it went to number four, um, right? I, I couldn't crack the Hunger Games, man. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and then another book that is a, that is um, not in this series, Mommy May, I also went, climbed the charts, and, and they both hit the bestseller list. So, actually, at that point, Amazon came in. They offered me a, a three-book deal. Um, they bought those two books and then they bought a second book in this series we're going to read from today titled Blood and Roses. So, and then they did, I actually also did three young adults for them, uh, young adult books. And then what happened in 2015, I went through not a very fun divorce and it really took the, um, it really took it out of me to write. Like I just lost my motivation. Um, 
there was a lot going on there. And, and, but yet I'd started this book that we're going to read from today, Deadly Affairs, and I knew I wanted to finish it. So this is, this book is the longest birthing process of a book that's ever occurred. And <laughs> so I talked with this other friend that I had worked with on some novellas and, and I said, I really want to finish this book. I'm having a lot of difficulty and, you know, I'm not sure what to do here. And she had this great idea to, for me to pair up with Christine and it just, we just clicked, man. We just like, we started talking about ideas and, you know, I was halfway through the writing of the book and I said, I, I need to get back into this. And, um, and we just, we, we were able to really, really make this work by, I, I, like you said, I take the pieces of, of the uh, detective and the crime solving piece and she's doing the, the killer and some of the backstory on that. So it's been really fun because it actually is almost like for me solving the crime. Like I can really get into my protagonist's head and really solve the crime, even though I know what's going on. It's, it's a very different way of writing, but it, I, I, I enjoy it. So I think, well, I, not that I think, I know after this, we're going to do quite a few more books and other series together. We've already made that decision. So it's been, been, been fun, been really cool. It has. It's been very synergistic. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and I, I've talked to a few writing partners over the time. I've had a, a couple on here that write together some uh, sometimes it's uh, one will write one chapter and then they hand it over the other one to take over the next chapter uh this is the first time where i've heard of authors writing the different characters and then combining it together now what was that what was that process like uh and did you know what the other was going to be doing what was coming up well I think we didn't really know what the process was going to be like when we started. Cause like I said, I'd, I'd already written half the book and well, actually not quite half because the book's become quite a bit longer, but I don't think we really knew. We kind of had to feel our way through the process and we found that this, this way worked the best for us. Um, we do know where it's going for the most part, because I had a pretty extensive outline as to, you know, to, to work from. So, so that piece, but, I don't think we realized at first, I think we did, we did talk about like taking chapter by chapter. I, I have worked with other co-authors in that way. Um, but this just, I don't know how that clicked, but her voice fits so well, not to like, you know, say that Christine's a serial killer, but her, her voice fit really well in those pieces. So I think that's right, Chris. Like just it was good you know and I was like man this this is this is really you write this I mean something I read last night that she read from the dialogue from this killer's voice like voice is just like I'm like oh my god this is brilliant like it was brilliant so Michelle tell me a little bit about um, the inception for this story since this is originally your story how did this come about like what what crossed your mind and, and uh, developed the deadly affair so the way this story came about, this is the fourth book in the series, the, the uh, Homicide Detective, it's the Holly Jennings um, thrillers. And in this fourth book, the way this came about was when I started writing it, I don't know if you recall, there was a scandal that hit the media a few years ago, uh, the Ashley Madison thing, where there were people Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, cheating on their spouses and you know some high-profile people and they were being uh, ex things were being exploited. It was a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. So I thought about basically a, a killer who takes out cheating spouses, um, <laughs> and 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 that's really that was that was the the what if, and uh, and it developed into there's more than one killer, there's a whole, you know, and there's, and there's a whole background story as to how it develops. Um, I always like when I write thrillers from a psychological point of view, even though these are serial killers, um, I always wanted to know when I was reading them, like, why? Like, what is the why behind this person becoming this way? And you know, I've done a lot of research and sometimes there is no rhyme or reason, but there's, there's a lot of times where, where, what, what creates a killer? That's always the question behind the books that I'm putting out. And the, the, 
the, the way I go back, the way we go back and forth, we're actually jumping time. So, and, and I, I have to make sure that the time is stamped real, real, very clearly. So you actually see the development of how this killer or killers come about because I'm jumping from present time back to, it goes to 1985, 1998, then 2006, 2008, then comes to the present. And I know readers sometimes get, like, uh, hate the jump time thing, but, but I think for my readers, they like it, right? And it builds it up. And then I also in the present time, obviously have my protagonist, Holly Jennings, and she's, she's solving it. And she's got some subplotting stuff that weaves throughout the series. Although I really work very hard on these books to make sure they stand alone so that if somebody does pick up book four, there is a subplot that's been running along all four books. However, you're not going to go uh, it could be like, I don't know what's happening here, right? There's enough mm -hmm. of an explanation for that reader to to feel like they they have a really good grasp of, of that subplot, but not overkill for the reader who's followed all four books. Uh -huh. So, yeah. Yeah, but um, that's really how it came about was this whole Ashley Madison thing. And 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 I do write a little bit about that in the book when when as the detectives are solving things. Oh, wow. So it uh, it puts a whole new slant on the title. Yes, Deadly Affairs, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Which which some would say justified. Y yes, some would. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in fact, is the second book in the series. It was interesting because I I'm a I'm a horse person, and that one has to deal a lot with the racetrack. And I did a lot of research on horse racing and some of the brutalities that go on behind the track and. Uh, there were parts of me that with this killer, because he was really humane to the animals, but he's not humane to people. I was like, you know, he's sort of justified, man. You know, so, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, not that any killing anything's justifiable, but, you know, I was like, you know, if any killer is going to kill, like, at least he's like, he loves animals. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So, all right, well, so then, Christine, what was your angle on coming into this, uh, like, an existing series and that you're being brought in uh, for this book? Um, what was your thoughts on that? Um, so when our friend first connected us, um, so Michelle, like she had mentioned, had worked with this friend on a series of novellas. And when she approached her about working on the serial killer thriller, the friend is, she doesn't do anything this dark. Um, so when we first connected and Michelle and I, I took a look at the manuscript, my first, my first response was like, I am weirdly qualified for this exact story <laughs> because the list of, uh, I mean, she, we're talking about potential, you know, stunts. I have a karate, you know, martial arts background. I work with other authors on their fight scenes. I've written a book on fight scenes for authors. Um, I have a background. My dad did a lot of hypnosis. He was a hypnotherapist when I was a kid. So that plays a part in the story. Um, I learned how to throw knives. That plays a part in the story. And I'm like... I don't know how how I could have been like better prepared for some of the details in the story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> as far as like her serial killer profile, and I'm just like, oh my gosh. And and one of the characters uh, is a horror movie director, and so my background is horror, and this is kind of on the the it's this is dark and it's it's plenty crazy. Um, this story and I, I tend to write even darker in my own stuff. Mm. So it was, this is almost on the lighter side for me <laughs> in a, in a way. Um, although it's pretty, it's pretty fantastic. I'll be honest. Like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know that I would really say that anything about this story is that light at all, but that's kind of, I think I answered your question. Like that's, that's yeah. how it came about for me. And it was like, this instant it, it it was it was beyond even just the content of the story and the details that that Michelle had already kind of brainstormed 
for uh, these characters, but it was, it's also like, we are very similar. Like we talked about, you know, kind of the way that our, our lives have gone and the ages of our kids. Like she's, she's like just ahead of me as far as everything in life goes. Um, and there was a moment where she even asked, we were talking about a, like a, a life, what would you call it? It's called life book, but Oh, yeah. She's like, have you ever heard of Lifebook? And I was like, oh my gosh, no way. I just did mine like two months ago or something. This is when, when we were first talking. <laughs> and and we we have so many parallels in in life and in our value system and everything. So there there's a whole other side of it where working together kind of felt like it was meant to be. Mm-hmm. Mm. So that's how it's all come together for me. And I think you, I think you said something earlier too that your your writing together is very simpatico. It's very almost like uh, couples who've been together for a long time will start to answer each other's questions before they ask it. Uh, it the stories go in one direction, and you know, Michelle's got it going this way, and then Christine's saying, oh, "Yeah, we got to go here. Here's the darkness, and uh, putting it all together so that it works." Yeah, there have been moments where Michelle's even told me, she's like, we lo- we still like this girl too much, or she still seems too obviously innocent. Um, mm. So there there have still been moments where um, we've we've kind of taken a look at it like this, even just individual scenes. And we're we're at that point also in the I mean at the point this comes out, the book will be released. But today we're still looking at the details of some of the scenes and getting those little, like, I don't know, final details, little bits of that, that spice or, or the -hmm. little things. Yeah. Um, Yeah. We're, 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 it it is very simpatico. And like, I think what we're doing, so we, we put everything in a Google drive and, um, and I'll go through and read it and just, and do notes you know, particularly in the ones like where if I'm confused on something, then she'll go back in and clean that up or I'll add to it if it, if I, you know, you know, and vice versa. Uh, again, it's been a process to try like figuring out our process together, but it's been really, really good. And I, I think it'll be different when we start something together from scratch, right? Like I think we'll have this whole process down really well. This has just been different because Christine's had to come into the middle and, and kind of like help me clean it up. And, and really, you know, on a personal note, she lit the fire back under my, my ass because I was really struggling to even finish a book. Like, like I said, and, you know, I've had readers asking me for this book for two and a half years. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, I knew I owed it to the readers to get it out there. And I, but yet I also wanted to find if I was going to, partner up with somebody I needed to find somebody who could could also write in my my voice um Mm -hmm. and and Christine does that really well and and I think that having the piece where she's doing the killer and some of these other characters outside of say my my protagonist who I know really well you know it, it it's just it's it's worked it's it's been a it's been a lot of fun yeah it has yeah it's almost like playing, it's almost like a game, like, um, you know, like, like, oh, what do you, what do you want to do with this? And it's just, it's a, it's a different way of writing. And I think, you know, we're all writers here, so we know how isolating that can be and it can be really solitary. So it's really fun to have that piece. Like, cause I think you're in, when you're in the middle of it, you're looking at it going, is this even any good? Right? Like, yeah. like, like that's what you're like. <laughs> do that and then you bounce it off your partner and 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 she's like yeah it's actually really good and then you're like oh yeah you know, it kind of is but when I get to this point as a writer and I'm writing it by myself I'm like this this sucks you know <laughs> <laughs> it, it does start to get a little weighty at this point in time because it's um the manuscript is big enough that just going back to look at a detail that you needed to check on can take some time and that so we're 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 definitely at the point where we're in the home stretch 
with a lot of that. And it, but yeah, the, the story is, it's substantial. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Awesome. So now how about these, these characters? I mean, was there, did you find yourself putting anything from real life into some of the characters or anybody who spoke to you in particular? Well, let me think. Really, when I look at, when I do character sketches, there's always a piece of somebody in there and then uh, then all sorts of pieces, right? Where then, like, I take certain aspects or personality traits from one person and then from another person and then mm -hmm. you sort of amplify them so that yeah. they're bigger, a little bit bigger than life. They're not so far out there where they, they're unbelievable, but there's a little bit of a piece that makes them larger than life. I don't know so much in this series that I've done it. Um, I've done it in some of my mystery series where I, I recognize when like, oh, that's a piece of, you know, you know who. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but you always have the, like when you talk to people, you're like, oh no, you're not in my book. Definitely not. <laughs> you know, the inside voice is so, oh yeah, you're the guy that, that gets totally knocked off. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's always an uncomfortable uh, conversation when somebody asks like, is this me? Right. <laughs> no, it's nothing about you. <laughs> no, like houses, you know that kind yeah. of. Yeah, right? I, I know. Same hairstyle, same height, same build. Yes, eye color. Yeah, and oh, it's same catchphrase that you have, but that's not you. No, not you. Mm -mm. Yep. <laughs> no. Oh my goodness. Well, so uh, this is you said this is book four in the series. This is book four. Mm -hmm. And. And I can't remember, did you already say, do you have a plan for, for more? Yes, because I the subplot has not been tied up and it needs to be tied up because it gets a little bit bigger in this book. So, you know, this for me is kind of like my Alex Cross series, like like Patterson. Like this is kind of, and, and probably, I mean, Christine and I have discussed it. I think uh, I'll go back to writing this this series now that I'm like, okay, I'm over that hump, but she and I have a whole nother plan for um, some really cool paranormal stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I like writing the paranormal as well. So, and she's really good at it. So we, we have this whole, we, we actually have quite a few plotted out in a, in a series that we're gonna do together. And I'm, I'm gonna continue the, the, um, the Holly Jennings thrillers. So yeah, yeah, I've got the next idea in my head brewing right now. But then I also have a couple of mystery series ideas. That, that's the problem with writing under two names and writing in, in a couple of different genres is my brain will go one way and then it wants to the next day go another way. So I have to focus it in on what I'm working on at the moment. Oh, yeah. 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 Now, is that difficult um, juggling the personalities, the, those, those author uh, names? Um, it's difficult in the aspect, like I said, where, where I will get an idea for like, because the Michelle Scott brand is in my, from my point of view is very different than the AK Alexander brand. Right. Mm. So it's different. It's, it's hard. And then that way there, I'm like, oh my gosh, I get an idea that I really like, and I want to run with, with, you know, under my, under my name but then I'm writing an AK Alexander book. So I have to kind of put that on the back burner. I mean, I have done a balancing act where I've written under the two different names at the same time. I worked on two projects and that is kind of hard because they are so different. Um, there's always killings no matter what, for the most part in whatever I'm writing, <laughs> even, even the young adult stuff. And um, so there is that, but the Michelle Scott book is a lot lighter. It's quirkier. There's humor. There's usually a little bit of romance in it. It's just a difference. They're whodunits for the most part. Um, you know, the AK Alexander stuff is definitely darker. There's, you know, far, far more violent. Um, and for whatever reason, those seem to sell better. So I like, guess <laughs> that's a little something about human nature. <laughs> I'm always interested when, when an author has an alternate identity, do you ever talk about uh, your alternate identity in one or the other? series uh, those books or do they ever cross over like does ak alexander ever mention michelle scott or vice versa or do the the characters ever talk about somebody from the other series as kind of an introduction like oh by the way i have this other series well i do put so in in the back like in my bio it'll it'll say that you know i write i also write under this name and i mm -hmm. you know whether it's thrillers or mysteries and then 
what's funny is in this in this deadly affairs book actually the last couple of these holly jennings thrillers there's a a, a dr scott um in, and he's the forensic pathologist like he's the you know the forensic guy so or psychology so so it's kind of interesting that i I took that, but that that's really all like, I, I don't really do too much crossover just because they are, they are, they are vastly different types of books. Uh, I don't think I have a ton of crossover readership, but I'm not really sure. I mean, maybe, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm always curious about that. Like if it's, you know, like creating that world, cause it was something that I experienced that I did not expect at all. Like I, wrote one story and I had a character in there and I'm writing a completely different story. And all of a sudden this other character from the first story pops up and they're, like I said, they're completely different, but yeah. this character popped up and I was like, Oh, what are you doing here? You don't need to be here, but right. it works. I'm like, ah, all right, maybe I'll leave it there and we'll see if anybody catches on that. Hey, wait a minute. That's the same person from over here. So. <laughs> well, it's actually not a bad idea. I mean, I, you never know. I might, I might, I might do that now that you, you just gave me that idea so <laughs> trademark jason my skill the sample chapter podcast yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> uh christine uh, how about how about you and and writing any any difficulties with the the different writing identities no i and i'm i'm honestly just forming mine right now and trying to wrap my head around the so in in writing under the different identities like the the point is to do your readers a favor so that they know if they're not not that they don't know who you are or that you write all of those books but that each identity kind of has its own flavor and they have my concept is under my name it's more i write middle grade it's still horror but it's not adult and um, like Michelle, it's kind of the same concept. And I, I really took this note from her, but I'm trying to keep a line so my readers know how dark they're going. So if they read uh, one pen name, the CM Adler, they know that they're going to get some pretty dark themes, uh, definitely adult. Um, there's probably not anywhere that I in particular wouldn't dare to go as far as crime or, or uh, violence or blood or any of that and then under my real name with the middle grade even though it is still horror it's definitely more playful um, not even necessarily that it's that, that that name is going to be all just a younger audience but that whatever you you'll get a little more humor um, and, and it's not even, I guess, not even necessarily more humor, but proportionately you'll get some lighter scenes, some more playfulness over the darker, more graphic moments yeah. and things. So, and, and I would say with the young adult, there's probably certainly no crossover, like a, a character that was in the young adult that's now in the more adult books or a place or something like that. No, not at this point in time. Um, a lot of what I'm doing is... Yeah, as you as you become a better writer, so in in kind of redefining my my identity as an author, um, I am reworking some of my original concepts. So the the books that I originally, you know, you the very first book I published, like I said, it was a young adult dystopian. I was approached by a publisher. And they specifically requested a young adult version. And so that's what I gave them. But it, I never really felt like it did the story justice. And everybody who read it could kind of tell I was censoring myself pretty heavily mm -hmm. as far as what I, what I described and the details that I would give in a scene. So I am reworking a, a lot of my original content to be, I would say, what it really should have been in the first place. Um, but, um, so with young adults, I, I don't know that that's, I kind of st tend to stay down in middle grade or all the way up into adult. Young adult is a really interesting gray area for me because, and it doesn't, I should know it because I taught high school for so many years, but 
most most teenagers really can handle adult themes and so I think that's where I get a little hung up is trying to censor for the masses what they think teenagers like um, versus you know the teenagers I worked with they could they would prefer the same content that we give to adults like I don't know that they necessarily needed anything censored yeah by age yeah can I touch on that for a minute, Jason? Yeah. Because I, uh, you know, I've got a young adult series and I feel the same way, Christine, in that um, you had to, you have to, you have a fine line because I knew that that readership was going to be, you know, 13 and over. And you don't want to be insulting to them because they're a lot smarter than a lot of people give them credit for. And they know a lot, you know, they, they're, they're a little more worldly, I think, today's teenager than you know, but it, it would, was interesting because I would get reviews from parents say that was like, you know, this is way too adult, like this, you know, but then, but then the kids, like the, the when I would have reviews from, from young adults, they, they, they love the stories. So, cause I was dealing with real themes that I think young adults do deal with, you know, mm -hmm. their sexuality, um, alcohol, drug, like things that are really that, that the kids are faced with. So, you know, and I've raised three kids and they were already, you know, I think my youngest, when I put, put that series out was, was 14. So I, you know, I knew, I knew what I was dealing with, but I think it is a fine line and, and you do have to have a little, obviously a little bit of censorship. Um, and, you know, coming from the backgrounds, Christine and I come from, we're writing adult themes you know, you really have to kind of tone that down. So, um, but I, I, I loved writing the young adult stuff, I, but again, like I, I write across the board. So I write all sorts of things and I don't like to limit myself. I mean, my, my thinking and with my writing and not everybody would agree because particularly literary agents like to get you into a, a hole and, you know, like for me, it was cozy mystery genre for a long time. Well, I wanted to break out of that. I wanted to write thrillers. For me, when I get an idea, it's just about the idea. I go, is this a good idea? Do I, does this motivate me? Does this excite me? Does this inspire me? And that's what I want to write. Like I could probably, if I just focused on say one type of book, really grow a larger readership, but that's just not, that's not how I want to write. I just want to write what inspires me. You know, that's a little bit of a tangent, but off of the young adult stuff, but just because we've done we've done so, so many different types of books, you know, and now we're going to go from, thrillered into paranormal <laughs> right yeah I th and I feel the same way about writing I just I want to write what pops into my head uh, yeah. not necessarily what it, it's it's always that fine line between okay is this a job in a business and what would make the most money versus what gives me the best energy and experience just this is how I'm spending my life I guess you could say. So I'm, I'm like Michelle where it's just like, like maybe I might someday, you never know. I could write a romance. It could happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I might not touch that one just cause I would just, I just don't know that I could ever do it justice. But what I can't, can say about inspiration is that, I mean, when I start out a book, whether I'm doing something like this with a partner or I'm doing you know, a dark thriller, I'm doing a light cozy or whatever it is. My whole idea, and it's always been this way, is is what is my goal? And the goal is to be have have a book be a touch point of, of joy to the reader. And what I mean by that, and that sounds weird when you write dark stuff, but you know, life is heavy, obviously, right? We're I mean, look at what we're all dealing with globally right now. There isn't one, you know, eight billion of us have been traumatized at some level from everything. And, so even though I, it might be dark, if somebody picks up one of these books and reads it, the idea behind it being a touch point of joy per se is that they, they are taken out of their everyday world and they're being entertained at some level, right? So their mind can go down the rabbit hole of this story and get some kind of joy from that. So, so it doesn't matter what I write. That's always the purpose behind what I'm writing. I love it. I love yeah. it. So, all right, well, so Christine, and you have written a lot of darker stuff in the past, and then now you are taking on the persona of the killer. So in your opinion, what makes a killer? 
Oh, yeah. So <clears throat> my background uh, with teaching was at a therapeutic boarding school. Uh, mm -hmm. So I worked with teenagers who, I mean, you would, you, they were pretty much the kids who'd been kicked out of their own detention. Like they, they were just the, out of options for school. So we dealt with some harder behavioral stuff, a lot of psychological uh, harder psychological profiles, not anything, you know, clinical or heavily medicated, but I, I have had a lot of experience with narcissism and um, schizophrenia and borderline personality. And uh, like I said, my dad has quite a history as a hypnotherapist, and then he became a marriage and family therapist, working with families. And a lot of what, I mean, serial killers require some significant trauma in their childhood where there's, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to end up with uh, that complete social apathy or, you know, it's all, it's all kind of on the, the, the spectrum of narcissism and degrees of narcissism, but it's, it's where people get split personalities and where um, they get that, like I said, the social apathy, the, so, those sociopathic tendencies where they don't attach to other people or don't have that empathy. And that, that mostly just comes from some pretty heavy childhood trauma. And it's, it's a, it's honestly like, it's a form of human survival. It's, mm -hmm. but it's the dark side of survival yeah. versus yeah. the, the people who gain more empathy and more connection to humans as from their, from their own trauma or, or grief. So a lot of my experience was just, was working with, um, that population, not, not necessarily on the dark end of sociopathic people, but the, definitely the, on the, the different, different degrees of empathy versus apathy. Yeah. So I, I, they're coming up with kind of the backstory as far as like some of the details that have occurred in, in the characters' lives. They're not even necessarily in the story, but they are in my head. So I, I do kind of know what kind of trauma it would it would take to create someone that willing to to be to be violent mm -hmm. uh, that that's fascinating because and, and it's something that a lot of your basic reader doesn't understand about the author process is how much we do in the background research and writing wise and how much is not going to be on the page because if you want to make a three-dimensional villain we need to know all that background information, even though it may not be on there. Uh, but without that information, it does, they do come out as two dimensional. Haha, I'm twisting my mustache and I'm going to go tie somebody to the railroad tracks. And that's the end of it. You know, it's like, I'm evil because I am. Whereas it sounds like you're able to put that background information so that they're doing it for a purpose that we may not fully understand, but we know that it is there. Yeah. And it's, and it says, it's as deep as you can make it, at least in your head. So um, I think that's where Michelle and I work really well together, where it's like, even though not all the backstory or all of those details necessarily show up in the story, we are able to see in each other's writing whether or not that depth is coming across in the current story, in, in, in the scenes that we're writing. Um, so it's easy to say like, well, this one needs a little bit more of this or uh, that just, just that that's, that's definitely one thing that we do very well together yeah, in the, awesome. in the writing. Yes, I would agree. And yeah, you do know, you do so much plot. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big plotter. I do a lot, a lot of, a lot of outlining, plotting, sketching, like character sketches before I ever even get started. So I do think that not everybody realizes the kind of research that even, you know, when you're e even writing fiction, because you're always, there's always going to be somebody where if you miss something that, that they call you out on it. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have to be really conscientious of developing. I mean, you, you want your readers to feel like these are people that they, they would know, or they could know, or they could have right. So you, you never want to take it for granted. You, you've got to definitely develop a three-dimensional from, from, from every single character, you know, that you're, what you're writing. Um, mm -hmm. Even, even a side character, you know, they have to, you've got to bring this to life. I mean, 
some of the best responses I've had from readers in like when I write a series, I've, I can, I've read, received a few uh, emails saying, you know, basically in one series it was, I can't believe that, that this was a mystery series I did. I can't believe that Nikki chose, you know, this guy over that guy. And I'm like, okay, Nikki's not real guys, you know, but <laughs> that's what you, that's what you want, right? You want your reader to feel like these, these characters are, are real. And, and if they feel that way, then you've done your job as a writer, right? If they feel like they can connect mm -hmm. and even on a standpoint, like you're writing a killer, well, your reader may not connect with that person because, you know, the majority of us are not serial killers. Let's, you know, but you want them to, you want them to feel afraid. You want them to feel afraid, like, wow, that, that this type of person does exist or can exist. You know, and then then you want them to root for your hero who they know intimately, right? So uh, I think it's really, really important to to flesh everything out before you actually even start getting getting it down on the page. Like really, really have an idea who these more so than a plot line for me are the character sketches. Like really knowing my characters is a mm -hmm. big deal. Uh, can you tell us anything more about this upcoming series? Um. I don't Where? know. The idea is so good. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a really good idea. I, I will say that it is definitely our main motivation for getting this book done. <laughs> I, think, I think we're both extremely excited to to work on this other one and create. Um, well, we've already started. It's it. it it, it requires a good amount of discipline to be like, okay, we cannot chase that squirrel until we have this book done. We have, we have a deadline and we are at the very end. Um, we're both very excited for this other book. It, it is another definite testament to how well our brains click the concept for this and how far we've already kind of brainstormed the premise and the characters and I don't know the world for the, for this other series. So uh, we're, we're both excited to, it's paranormal. We're both excited to play a little bit with some magic. Um, even I mean, though, even, even in a deadly affairs in the, in the Holly Jennings books, there is a little bit of the paranormal, very subtle, very subtle, very yeah. subtle. Uh, we're we're gonna go full out into into some. The, it's going to be a contemporary series with a lot of historical background, um, yeah. but I think we're we're definitely both ready to kind of go play with some magic. Yeah, I think what I what we can say about it is it is gonna have a. There isn't anything that's not it's not gonna have in it. It's gonna have a, a lot of you know lore, witchcraft, uh, romance mystery murder family like it is gonna be yes and super fun and a little bit of the even though you're gonna have those pieces and the darker pieces in it it's a deviation from from writing serial killer stuff where i mean reality is when you when you do research on this stuff it's pretty dark right like yeah, it's, yeah. It's, and it's real like the, 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 these things are you know it's, sure it's not an everyday occurrence but it it is real and and there are people like this in the in our world i think when we go and do something outside of it on a paranormal level you know it's a little more fantastical so we can have a lot of fun and 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 do some things that are are, are different and 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 kind of suspend the the whole you know belief systems for for readers and i think it I think Christine's audience readership probably gravitates more to this than maybe mine so i think that's a Except, you know, I've written some under my, my, my name, but on a lighter level. So this is going to be interesting and to maybe open up another whole, whole, you know, demographic readership wise. So I think that's going to be, it's just good. I'm just super excited. I mean, like we, we call ourselves the squirrels because we do, we're like, Oh, what if we do this? And then, and then we can do this. And like, Wait, hold on. Let's get this one finished. Let's focus on that. You know? So. <laughs> It is. I think uh, it is definitely, there's a moment where it's hard to stay disciplined when you get so excited about the next 
world and and the this this other series i mean i would say that there are kind of no holds barred on this one i think that we're pretty excited because we we will really get to do there there will never be a moment where we'll be like hey could we do this in this story and then we say no like we'll be Mm. like sure let's do it yeah and you'll see when you see that when you see what it's about and hopefully we can come back on but when you you'll understand what we're talking about i just like would hate to to say anything more on it because it's, <laughs> it's really like, not that I think another writer out there would pick it up, but I think it's that good where somebody would be like, Ooh, that's real good. How do I twist that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> well, listeners, I tried, I tried, but hopefully uh, you ladies will let me know when that book is coming out so that way I can uh, share that with our, with our listeners. For sure. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, ladies, this has been so wonderful. I've, I've so enjoyed talking to you both. So where can we find and follow you, uh, Michelle? Uh, so I'm on, I have uh, my, my, my website's being re, re, revamped, but it's Michelle Scott with one L.com. My Instagram is, it's Michelle Scott author. And my Facebook, you can find me under Michelle Scott, AK Alexander. Mm. So. Yeah, I, 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 think I, I have a Twitter, but I'm going to be honest. I don't do the Twitter. I've got somebody else doing it for me. Just, <laughs> I could sit here all day and do the social media stuff. And I used to do all my own stuff like that. And it just becomes a time suck, right? So it, I, it does. You know, I have that attitude now that, look, my job is to be writing books. My job is to be telling stories. And if I can find somebody to help me do the other pieces, then that that's what I need to do because I'm here to write, right? That's my purpose. I there know you it. go. Christy, where can we find and follow you? Um, where I'm working on that. You met uh, our wonderful assistant, Barbie. Her nickname is Brain, and <laughs> you can find me mostly under Christine Nielsen. We are reworking a lot of my online presence, and uh, should have by by the time all of this comes out, um, you could find me under C M Adler or Christine Nielsen, and my website is queensandcrows.com. Wonderful. All right. So that would be home base. Yeah, and we'll have links to all that in the show notes, everybody, so you can grab uh, both ladies' books and follow them and find out more. And, of course, like I said, I'm going to be haunting these ladies to tell me when that uh, paranormal comes out in the future. But otherwise, for now, check out Deadly Affairs out today when this episode comes out. Again, thank you. Thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun, and I look forward to it. So this is... The, uh, the next book of the Deadly Affairs series uh, comes out September 1st, the same day that this episode drops. And ladies and gentlemen, you got to go pick it up. You got to check out this series. It's going to be a lot of fun and uh, maybe a little deadly. So oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> without further ado, it's time for me to sit back with my cup of coffee and enjoy this sample chapter from C.M. Adler and A.K. Alexander of Deadly Affairs. Okay. Chapter One. Tonight, the producer called herself Samantha Boyd. The director liked it. In fact, he'd chosen the name. Samantha, not Sam or Sammy, which sounded childish to her, would be certain there'd be no mistakes this time around. And tonight would be absolutely thrilling. Adrenaline and excitement coursed through her. Samantha, yes. It was a strong name and Samantha liked strength. Samantha had been born out of need because the other one, the first one, that bitch had messed up so badly on the last assignment. They could have gotten caught with her mistake and ruined it for all of them, but she'd fixed it. She had control and cleaned up the mess that the first one had made. And thanks to her tech crew, she'd done it in a way that not even the director knew about it. Samantha sat down at the bar, her eye on the game. The couple she'd carefully researched sat at the corner table pretending that they cared about being inconspicuous. They were oblivious to anything around them as they busied themselves playing footsie, making eyes, and grabbing each other's asses. They were hardly inconspicuous, though. At least Samantha could see them for exactly what they were. Liars, cheats, philandering spouses, narcissists only aiming for their own pleasure and gain. 
Samantha licked her lips and signaled the bartender. Dirty martini, extra icy, please. She hadn't had to travel too far to find what she was looking for this time, and now she would be patient. Being patient was part of the game, part of the script. Mrs. Francine Hollister had driven down to San Diego from Los Angeles, and Mr. Drew Garrison had flown in from New Orleans. The two had officially reconnected at their 20-year high school reunion three months ago in New Orleans, but their lust for one another had been building. The initial connection had happened months prior to the reunion. God, the internet was a wonderful thing. Even the internet had shadows and demons, dark places where it was a tool, all they needed to hunt with. And Samantha was certain she knew almost all there was to know about these two. It was all written down very carefully in her notes. Their lust, which she knew Francine had been misinterpreting as love, was sweet, really. Well, it would have been anyway if they weren't both married to other people. How easy it seemed for people to forget their vows these days. At least Drew saw this for what it was. In some ways, it made him the better of the two. He didn't love Francine. Samantha was sure of that. This was a game he played, and Samantha knew that he'd played it more than once. With the help of the tech, Samantha was a good researcher. Games, 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 games. Drew seemed to enjoy this game. Samantha smiled coyly at the bartender. If poor Drew only knew that his game had consequences, deadly ones. This was Samantha's second reunion couple. People reunited with past loves from all sorts of former life experiences. High school, college, jobs, childhood, one night stand. She and the director chose the ones from high school, those who wanted to relive their teenage glory days. She wasn't sure why they had, other than the, the group of cheaters seemed to be a fairly large pool to pull from. Ha! Not to mention because they were the largest categorically, it was almost assured that lending one or the other of the coupledom down a dark path wasn't really all that difficult. However, she left all of that to the tech. It really didn't matter, though, who they chose, because the thing was that it wasn't right to reunite in this way when marriage was involved, when others' lives could be ruined. No, that wasn't right at all. She knew this firsthand. Unrequited love and all should be chalked up to nonsense once vows had been taken. But these two didn't follow the rules or honor their vows. Samantha knew that Francine's husband, Mr. Marcus Hollister, was at home taking care of twin 13-year-old boys who were avid soccer players. Mr. Hollister was into security, the tech kind, which Samantha found a tad ironic considering that in a small way, she too was into those things. Actually made her even have more empathy for the mister. He was smart and good at his job. He'd done well for his family. He also helped his coach's boys' soccer team. He took his family to church on some Sundays. They had a nice group of neighborhood friends who got together for barbecues, very all-American. And from every account, this man seemed to love his wife and family. He actually appeared to adore them and had no qualms with his wife's travel for work as an advertising rep. Oh boy, though, if he only knew. Poor man. But was the missus happy? Oh no, silly, sexy Francine was bored, so bored. All Marcus wanted to talk about was his job or the boys and soccer and where should the boys think about going to college and what vacation sounded good to her. Marcus liked to let Francine make the decisions, all of the decisions, and she found this boring, so very boring. He didn't want to grow, earn more money, do more with his life. He was perfectly content, and she found this lacking, almost void of any masculinity. Good old Franny wanted some real excitement. Thus drew Garrison. What a moron Francine Hollister was, and now her idiocy and her boredom would be her ultimate downfall. And maybe down the line, Marcus Hollister would find someone who truly loved and appreciated him. If he knew what his missus was up to, well, Samantha was sure the poor guy would come unhinged. What husband wouldn't? If he knew, would he beat her to a pulp? Or would he threaten either of them? Would he hire a killer? Or would he just simply divorce her and carry his wounded heart within for the rest of his miserable life? Divorce was never final. Not really. And the hurt left behind at what had been done had to be unbearable. But death was final. Samantha would deal with that, and with the finality, there was a chance to heal, a chance to truly move on with one's life. And what of the other criminal in this duo, the dashing Mr. Garrison? He was a handsome, wealthy entrepreneur who had the perfect wife in Carrie Garrison. Poor Carrie. None the wiser of what the mister was up to at this very moment. 
Samantha admired Carrie. She was smart, funny, loved her three kids, and was an outstanding mother. She was on the board of countless charity organizations. Such a little homemaker, that one. Sure, she'd gotten a bit overweight, but damn it, what that happened to a lot of women? Women who had a full load of a family and the heaviness on her shoulders that surely her husband placed there while he was out gallivanting around and screwing his high school sweetheart. It was all in her notes, every detail. Samantha adjusted her sunglasses and pressed a tiny button at the corner top of the lens. A microscopic video camera turned on and went to work as she picked up her cell phone and made a call. The director clicked on. She knew that he liked being called, involved in some way. She could at least do that much for him since he couldn't do any of this without her. Hello, Samantha swiveled her bar stool around. I wish you could have come with me. It's such a lovely day here in Coronado. The ocean's beautiful. I'd love for you to see the view. Don't you wish you could be here? She laughed, noting the haughty tone in her voice. She liked it. She'd gotten good at this, at being someone else, someone special, at changing her name when necessary, at doing what needed to be done to right the wrongs that had been implemented on her and the director. I see the view and I approve, the director replied. That's excellent. Enjoy your late night movie. She switched off the phone, depressed the button on top of her glasses as she was simply adjusting them on her face and finished her drink. The martini had been good, one of the best she'd ever had. She wanted one more, but it was time to put her plan into motion and there was a lot to be done in the next few hours. She paid the bartender in cash and swiveled off the bar stool. The two people in the corner sneaking kisses and drinking their bottle of wine had other lives, spouses who loved them, kids who thought they could do no wrong. But the producer knew differently. She knew that they were dirty, disgusting criminals. She also knew that they wouldn't be for long. Drew and Francine were about to end their affair. Dun, dun, dun. Oh my goodness, that'll be a lesson for any of you philanderers out there. <laughs> that was C.M. Adler and A.K. Alexander reading a special sample chapter from their new release available today, Deadly Affairs. Hey, uh, thank you so much, ladies, for coming on the show. I had a great time. Uh, special shout out to their representative, Barbie McRae, for helping arrange all of this. As always, make sure you click that link in the show notes so that you can find out more about the ladies and their books and get that new one that's available today. While you're in there, click the links for our podcast friends and sponsors. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out next week when I'm back with Elaine Dodge and her latest book, Harcourt's Mountain. Until then, take care, everybody. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.